Greetings, film freaks. We are the Popcorn Kernels. Join us as we discuss the hard and often indigestible truths that are at the center of the fluffy and delicious world of cinema. What's popping, people? Welcome to the Popcorn Kernels podcast. My name is Adam, and joining me in your ear holes is Harry. Say hello, Harry. Mince potato and scurly. On today's episode, we will be talking about Get Out. This is a 2017 film directed by Jordan Peele and stars Daniel Kaluuya, Alison Williams and Catherine Keener. IMDb describes the synopsis as follows. A young African-American visits his white girlfriend's parents for the weekend, where his simmering uneasiness about their reception of him eventually reaches boiling point. Here is an original song to support the synopsis. Well, no, you can't trust one word that white bitch says. You better get out, get out, before you fall into something plain. Uh, this place is tough for a lover. Beware of the spoon clinking mother. White folks fighting one another. Bidding on my parts, I need to find oh, cover. No, you can't trust one word that white bitch says. You better get out, you get out, before you fall into something uh, uh, old people of intimidating wealth Utilising genetics, improving their health I've been hypnotised by a little pixie elf I won't be a victim to the hand I've been dealt uh. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Let's start with some facts about the film Daniel Kaluuya was given the lead role on the spot after nailing his audition Writer, co-producer and director Jordan Peele said Kaluuya did about five takes of a key scene in which his character needs to cry and each was so perfect that the single tear came down at the exact same time for each take. How do you do that? Talent, man. Pure, unadulterated talent. But where he must go so deep into something to be able to produce that single tear and it falls perfectly at yeah. the right moment. To be able to, to tap into that well and only pull out a certain amount instead of like digging deep and then bursting into tears or digging deep and not getting anywhere and nothing. But the fact that one tear comes out so consistently, that's masterful. It is masterful because some of the greatest actors of all time still have never done it. I've never seen, I've never seen Daniel Day-Lewis produce a tear that rolls down his cheek at the pivotal moment. I've never seen De Niro do it. Mm. I've never seen Pacino do it. I'd yeah. love to be proved wrong, but I have not seen any of these superstar actors actually produce that lone tear that just dripped down his face. And Kalua does it in the, film you believe it when he's when she, um he's being put on the spot by mummy law and it's just choking him his reaction's so real so yeah. surreal it's amazing i heard a, a very well known um film critic say that um kaluya is the greatest eye actor in the industry today I, and i've I never believe. i've never heard that as a term before eye actor but once i heard him say that i was like wow yeah i, I completely get it there's so many um, scenes in this film where he's not necessarily delivering dialogue. He's just reacting to something and, and the, the use of his eyes, those single tears, that, that pain, that terror, that, that frozen aspect of, of his performance, I think is, is brilliant. I was saying it a couple of years ago, not specifically about Daniel Kaluuya, but actors that use their eyes. Mm. You can, if you can act with your eyes and not just this overly physical Tom Hardy Acting, yeah. but if you can do it with your just your eyes and your, the way you time your reaction, you're, it's so much more powerful. Yeah, it totally is. And uh, I, I've seen this film a few times, and after hearing what that critic said, I paid more attention to what he does with his eyes. Mm. And it, it is it's mad to see that someone can be so impactful just just like that. Just such a small part of their repertoire, they can make it so important and so powerful. Yeah, I love it. Jordan Peele had seen him in um, an episode of Black Mirror, hadn't he? Yeah, yeah. Something like 15,000 points or something. The one where he's on a pedal bike. Is he's that got, the one he was in? I can't remember. Yeah, he's got to get the energy. You're, you're essentially producing energy by going on a pedal bike all day long. Mm. And he saw him in that. And that's yeah. what, I think that's what got him over. Yeah. You'd think they'd been lifelong friends forever. Yeah. They've, they've certainly got a bond that sort of developed into the, the latest um, Jordan Peele film, mm -hmm. uh, Nope, which I thought he was very good in that as well. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. I do like me some Aliens, though. Mm. Love it. Yeah. 
When director Jordan Peele was asked if Universal Pictures wanted him to do a sequel to this film, he stated, of course they have. It was the first thing they said, let's do a sequel. He goes on to say, honestly, I'm open to it. I love the project, but I won't do a sequel just for some kind of cash grab. If it's right, if it feels good and I feel like I can beat the original, I'll do it. He should never do it. Not even no. with the talent he possesses, with the talent at Kaluuya. I wouldn't because, because of the accolades it's received. I mean, it was it was um, ranked the greatest screenplay of the 21st century by the Writers Guild of America. If you really? go and do a sequel, I think you're lessening the impact of it and what it stood for and what the subtext of the film was. If you do a sequel, then it is just going to become a film. It's just a franchise, no hidden message. So you think a sequel would hinder its legacy? You couldn't top it for what it for what it did in its first go round. I yeah, I don't. I don't see where they could go with a sequel, considering how this film pans out and how this one concludes. I think it would be quite difficult to see where this this supposed sequel would go. I'd do it, look, Rod, um, Howry plays Rod, so Daniel Kaluuya's um, best friend in the series. I'd do it, look, he's so so weak for, for talent that when birds come for him, he just can't resist. And he, kn- he knowingly goes to one of these let's switch brain places because he's chasing tail. Yeah. Sex slave. So he's like a saboteur. To like himself. He, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, my final fact, this movie was filmed in 23 days. Amazing. That's crazy to me. Amazing. Yeah. Like imagine that 23 days, it cost 4.5 million to make and grossed 255 million. It's incredible. And it's lauded as one of the best films of the 21st century. Yeah. It's insane. The, you look at the production value, you look at the direction, the performances, like all of it as a total package, it, it just works. Amazing. And from start to finish to do something so accomplished in 23, di- 23 days yep. from a first-time director is quite the achievement. It's absolute proof that there's still room out there for original ideas with up-and-coming actors, not superstars, where it costs five million to make an exceptional film and gross more than some huge blockbusters. Yeah. Well, story's key, isn't it? If you've got a good story and you yep. know how you want to tell it and you stick to your vision... And yep. you've got people on on your same side, rowing in the same direction. You, it's you know the possibilities are endless. Yeah, a camel is a horse designed by a canoe. Yep, yeah. Keep the horse pill. Stay on that horse. Stay on that horse. Don't ever, like, is there a horse in Nope? Yeah, horse, horses actually play, play a big part in Nope. I thought they did in the trailer. Yeah, it was good. I'm yeah. excited to watch it. Stay on that horse. I I I never got off the horse. That's nice. I did. You did. My yard's full of camels. <laughs> Oh, man. What did you uh, like about the film? I've always been a firm believer uh, that a horror film can be just that without a uh, bleak ending. And I love that Jordan Peele um, went against the grain in allowing his main lead protagonist, Chris, to survive his ordeal. Usually it's always bleak. He even test screened the uh, an alternative ending where Chris gets arrested by police and it is police that turn up at the end and then he's fighting the justice system. So it would have been a subtext for the inequality of, uh, you know, the arresting and imprisonment, incarceration of, of black people yeah. over, you know, how they're treated differently to white people. But he did test screenings and the audience felt robbed because they followed the story of Chris and you're you're seeing it through his eyes. Well, you're you're um, cheering yeah. for Chris. You you want Chris to succeed. And it's so you? easy to either kill off your protagonist in a horror film or to leave it in a really depressing, bleak ending. And just him observing his audience, he respects his audience enough to think it's not fair to to do that to them. And and then he, I'm so glad that he decided to allow Chris to get away from it because it's still a great horror film. And I've always disagreed that it always has to end tragically. Like yeah. I think the thing's great for that. Because, yes, they, they probably don't live. McCready and Charles, yeah. who's Keith David and uh, Russell, and they probably don't live, but the audience don't know that. They're left talking at the end, aren't they? See, I, I differ slightly because I don't like horror films that end with just total protagonist victory. How rare, though. But what I, I really appreciated how this one's tied up that the person you're rooting for, we see the real evil of his captors. We, we see it all and we want him to be victorious and he is victorious. I would have certainly felt shortchanged if the film finished and he ended up getting nicked mm-hmm. for the reasons you, you stated earlier, because he's a black man mm-hmm. at the scene of a, a white person crime. He's instinctively and immediately 
um, painted as the villain without them yeah. having any con context or idea of what's happened. It could have been like the end of um, the new Candyman that came out two years ago. Yeah, where you know he gets he gets shot, killed by police, and um, you know that's not Candyman. Candyman yeah. is is this is this being that lives between worlds who survives all all deals yeah so um i think yes it was sent a big message in candy man that he gets shot by police and he's unarmed obviously it's very political it yeah. breaks the fall for a little because you're you're being dragged into what's outside the cinema of course which there could be an argument for and against that some yeah. you know sometimes it works powerful and sometimes it's it's um bit on the nose it takes away from the film it can do yeah but yeah. in this one i thought it was excellent that he um he allowed chris to continue yeah yeah, as I say, I would have been pissed off if if he'd gone the other route. Um, what else did you like about Get Out? Uh, I love look, it's done for modern audiences what um, George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead did for audiences back in '68. Okay, cool. Isn't, because um, George A. Romero's uh, casted Dwayne Jones in the 1968 film, and he was the first first ever black actor who was uh, the star and hero of the film. And it's obviously it's. it's it took enough time has passed now where that's that's forgotten, mm. and it's you know it's a zombie film set in 1968. And your lead got your lead guy John uh, John Dwayne is uh, Dwayne Jones is um, yeah he's the hero. And if you if you think of like how much effect that would have had in 68 for audiences to go and watch that, yeah, I think this does the same for modern audiences. Yeah, because it's very rare you get a black lead in a horror mm. film. Very rare. They're usually either um, the friend of the protagonist or the first victim yeah yeah i think keith keith david is the first uh one of the very very first black actors to survive a horror film really in the, in the thing yeah 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 there's not many there's yeah. not many at all so it's it was amazing to have um a lead actor and you follow his story throughout and it was just reminiscent of how powerful it was when george a romero did it with night of the living dead yeah really cool i mean that that ties into something i love about about the film is how triggering it, it must be for those idiot racists out there because you have a black director mm. where the, the lead is a black protagonist and the antagonist, the villain, are a upper class white family. It's quite rare to see the upper class white family as villainous mm. in films unless it's in then it's like villainous. A, unless it's in like a downtown abbey situation mm. where the snooty rich people uh look above themselves on the people that work for them. It's all classist and stuff like that. So I do like that that, you know, get out has probably rubbed up the racist the wrong way. Well it'll go against their agenda, wouldn't it? Exactly that. So yeah. seeing look, there's strip back all of your your ignorance, say skin colour. And it's it's I saw a great diagram once of um it shows a heart, a real heart on the left and a real heart on the right. And at the bottom, it said black black person, white person. Yeah. It was exactly bloody same. Exactly, of course. It so is. it was it was it's, it's it's great when you look at it in that from that concept. But I think ignorance is um is 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 inherited. Of course, I think yeah. it, it comes from parents. It comes from uncles and aunties. And on the rare occasion, it could come from personal experience. It could just be on that one night. That instead of the four white guys around the corner that beat you up, it was one black guy that beat you up, and that's why you're a and racist. That, yeah, so you you um, build a, a grudge yeah. against yeah the the race of people that yeah. attacked you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's ignorant. You got to feel sorry for ignorant people because it's just laughable. I think it's clever in films when you know um, Tarantino's always been amazing at it, where he shows his you know in and uninhibited white guy just being the token racist, and he's doing it because it's hilarious. Look. Even now, it's still in them. They've got these really weird yeah. beliefs about an Aryan race being superior and stuff, and it's just, it's laughable. It, well, it is, isn't it? And our time on Earth is so short. Imagine con most of your life is being consumed by that hate of mm. a, a group of people that you don't even necessarily know or you, you haven't personally connected with. You've just got this default setting based on your upbringing that you hate this group of people because mm. of reasons. It's, it's really absolutely depressing. bizarre. Yeah, man, it is. It really is. Uh, what else did you like about Get Out? Uh, Daniel Kalura, amazing performance, but we covered that in the facts. Just um, the range of emotion he can he can do, you know, and yeah. and I felt I feel uncomfortable for him. And I'm a I'm a 34 year old white man, and the most uncomfortable parts aren't even the bits about how he's about to have his uh his entire existence and being is about to be taken from him. The most uncomfortable parts is where they're trying to find familiarity with him at a drinks party. Like, oh, I really like Tiger Woods. Yeah. It's like, oh. And the fact is, you know people that are like that. 
Mm. They they might may be well intentioned and trying to connect with a person of different race by saying they respect or support a public figure of that mm. race. I've and been there though with the, with with sexuality. So I when I was going through college, one of my biggest heroes in, of my life is my teacher, uh, one of my drama teachers, and he he was a homosexual man. And I would forever I would just look up for him all my life. I was just like, this guy is amazing. He's so he's so smart. He's so inspiring. But when I talk to him or meet him for a drink stuff, I could I found myself just constantly looking for um, subject matters related to the LGBTQ community. Exactly, and I yeah. would do it. Yeah, you know, I would I would talk about uh, musicians that are gay. I talk about actors that are gay, and it's like I thought. And then I realised much later in life that like how nauseating that must have been for him. Yeah, I think there's a if it's well intentioned, there's an element of just sort of almost a sweet innocence about it because you're trying to find common ground. You're trying to relate to a person that doesn't necessarily, you can't necessarily connect with on a foundational level. Well, I want to be perceived as a good person. Well, yeah. So you can equate that to, I know I love, I love my football. I know a lot about football. If I'm in a drinking environment at a pub and there's some proper Jack the Lad scaffolders swearing and talking about football, I'll change my persona. I, I know my football, but I'll, I'll be a little bit more sort of aggressive in the way I talk about football. Well, you see West Ham yeah, at the oh, weekend? fucking hell, mate. Did you see They're that chance in this? Oh, fucking oh. hell. We had no right putting that one in, man. Yeah, like, so, all of that. yeah that's good logic I if think, you apply it to that. I think there's an element of that in, in all of us, but in the, in the um, situation, situation in, in get out it is nauseating because they're rich upper class people looking to sort of take what makes chris a, a great person and and use it for their own benefit mm -hmm. and to try and relate to him to try and make him feel more at ease it is very uncomfortable it makes you it makes your skin crawl it's always itchy it's, it's yeah it's not nice you know he's a diehard arsenal fan yeah i knew that and it's the one thing i don't like about him he said um that the team who must not be named i.e tottenham he says they're the voldemort of the league <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing i love that yeah, yeah I'd, I'd agree with that but I, I do hate arsenal more than tottenham down the gunners yeah down the gunners um yeah my favorite thing about get out is is yeah, definitely the same as one of yours is is Daniel Kaluuya, the man himself. Uh, his performance as Chris proves he's superstar quality, powerful, emotional and layered. Uh, he spearheads a great cast and is is pivotal to the the film's success. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've since I saw this film several years ago, I've been a Kaluuya fan. I think he's excellent in mm -hmm. every, everything he does. And I'm I'm really excited to see where his career takes him because uh -huh. he's obviously getting quite um, a repertoire behind him. He's getting a lot of accolades. He's won an Oscar. He's he's obviously so hot right now. First um, first British African heritage actor to ever win an Oscar. That's mad. And in British what? African heritage. 2020, 2019? For Judas Black Blackland. Yeah, so... But Judas and Black Messiah. Yeah. So it was it recent, wasn't it? Yeah. Very recent and fully deserving, I think, because he was superb in that. I also love the balance of the film. Um, Get Out is a superb medley of genres with such important racial subtext at its core. The film manages to be a drama, horror, thriller, uh, comedy all at once. The the subtle racism that mirrors realistic uh, societal prejudices is paired with... Uh, honest depiction of the black experience from a black perspective to make a film that well it, it entertains and educates it's sad as well because it's almost like Kalua's character and it's, it's very realistic because he's adapted to that micronized racism even the police officer asking for his license he doesn't yeah. even want to argue he just gets it out known full well that there's no re he wasn't even driving there's no reason why that guy needs to see his license well, it's, it's that form of like it's like passive racism that mm -hmm. i think is is for older generations it's almost built into them to their dna mm -hmm. like i've seen game shows before where they've got the the people that are playing to to win the quiz so to speak the host of the quiz will will greet each person individually and it comes to a, a black fella and it, it, you literally see him go uh, hey bro what's going on and like does does like a oh. awkward handshake that he doesn't do with any of the other contestants oh, god and the person doing it, the host that's doing it, I won't name any names, doesn't see him, himself being anything other than friendly. But if you look at that from from maybe a black person's perspective, you'd mm -hmm. be like, well, hang on, why am I getting this... Special treatment. This different, yeah, this mm -hmm. different, like, greeting to everyone else. And I think Get Out does such a good a good job at showing those those sort of innate racist My, qualities. Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. I, I don't think... I mean, in this film, certainly... There's a there's a ulterior motive, but in everyday life, it's not necessarily meant as a nasty 
a nasty thing. It just it's just a bit tactless, a bit tasteless. That was what's quite scary about the film. So obviously the whole premise is that this um, rich historical white um, family have have, have created a, a new science where essentially, if you're a dying old person, you can we can take your consciousness and put it into another being, so you can live another eighty, ninety years. Yeah. What's what's um, scary about it is that it's not particularly racist in who they're picking. It's look, black is in fashion. Well, that's a quote directly from the film, isn't yeah, it? But yeah, but black is in. And that's what's quite creepy because one or two of them is like the, the new Ferrari's out or something. Yeah. And all of a sudden enough time's passed now where it's cool to be black. Yeah. And that's what's really creepy about it because when I first watched it, I just naturally thought, given that the the housemaid and the gardener are black, that they're trying to reintroduce um, slavery from from when it had been abolished. And I thought they were just trying to reintroduce slavery. Yeah, but it's not. It's clever than that. It's more layered than that. Yeah, and it's um, yeah, because if there was a sequel ten years down the line, it could be Asians the in thing. Yeah, it could just change like that. Yeah, so it's it's scary. Uh, it's it's creepy film, mm. and uh, I can't couldn't help myself feel how terrifying it would be to go into the sunken place oh fuck that yeah not having controls it'd be like a constant state of sleep paralysis yeah it's just below the consciousness right mm. so you can see everything that's happening but you you can't steer how you respond to it you're just underneath and yeah the thought of that is is a uh, is terrifying isn't it Catherine keener yeah terrifying oh yeah superb yeah. in this excellent but yeah god excellent yeah man um, talking of Catherine Keener, one of my favourite things about it was the teacup hypno hypnosis scene. It's a memorable moment in the film where Catherine Keener hypnotises Daniel Kaluuya. It's uh, it's impactful and powerful, and the scene is a testament to Peel's vision. Um, mm. And I think it will go down in cinema history as one of the best scenes from a directorial debut. Mm -hmm. It's iconic. Yeah. Like that first time he, she's sort of judging him by the, by the fact that he smokes. She starts, she starts to like dig in and, and try to understand what's happened with his mum and starts manipulating him and sort of lets lets her agenda come across that she frowns upon the fact that he smokes in front of his daughter. Oh, fuck me and off. this whole time... That is my daughter. The whole time she's clinking this cup and he's completely unaware that he's being slowly but surely hypnotised. That's ASMR, man. And then sink. Boo. Oh, and he goes, no, wait. Yeah, because he, he just feels it. And then there's that that visual representation of that. So he's sitting in the in the, the chair, and you see him falling. TV in space. And yeah, and then you see Catherine Keener's character looking over him as he's falling, and it's You're it's so powerful. Place. Yeah, the first time I saw that, I was like, I'm not scared, but I am completely absorbed by this yeah. i'm like jesus like that representation of how it must feel to be losing control of your own thoughts and your own mobility and all of that and oh man and to think that that's what lakeith stanfield's character is constantly seeing god he's constantly stuck in there fighting under the surface trying to be heard it was terrifying isn't it horrible i think that's a, a great um analogy that sleep paralysis that, mm. you, that it must be like that thankfully i've never yeah. experienced sleep paralysis I, I i don't i would hate it the, the very thought of it you know, there's millions of people around the world that say they, they're asleep and then they see like a hooded figure come into their room, yep. climb on their bed, sit on their chest and they can't do a single fucking thing about it. The hag. That terrifies the life out of me. There's, man. Yeah, there's a terrifying um, painting from the 16th century of uh, a, a weathered little hag laying on someone's chest. And that's oh, amazing God. if you think about it because someone had sleep paralysis in the 16th century. We know it now to be look, our brains woken up before, say, our physical self was woken up. It's, it's explainable. But in the 16th century, can you imagine? You told your priest or something. Oh, you get burnt. Something's burnt. on my chest and I can't get up. Burnt for Devil witch. witch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Devil. That. Yeah. I, it's mental, isn't it, as well, that people from around the world throughout history have had that same figure. Mm-hmm. That creeps and oh, I get the I get Crazy. the heebie-jeebies just yeah. thinking about it. without meeting Fuck that without even meeting. Say you could be an Englishman and then you could be a, uh, from Japan and it yeah. could be the 13th century. You've both had sleep paralysis, but oh. you've never met. I, I'm not going to lie. Even talking about it makes me think. Oh fuck! I'm going to get it now. There are nightmares. No, I don't. I don't like that. Talking of nightmares, what didn't you like about the film? Um, I didn't like that they don't resolve Lakeith Stanfield's character's fate. Yeah. Because he's a great, he's he's your first victim in terms of the film's uh, chronological order, and he's a captivating um, character. And I would have liked to have seen his fate resolved, maybe because Chris and Rod get away from from it. They get out. 
the fact that Lakeith Stanfield, they don't resolve what happened to him. Yeah. Like maybe you see him, like, can a doctor resolve this? Look, there's an old man in your brain and it's like a well, like, Hilkington pitch. Well, I, yeah, I'm, <laughs> that's, that's a great shout, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure because within the context of the film, you see one of the um, household helpers, which you later find out, has undergone the the surgery that this this um granny grandma this armitage family have have developed and the in the film chris uses a flash and it brings the the guy that is the actual guy out of the sunken yeah. place and his first instinct is to number one shoot the one of the yep. main problems yeah, of this yeah, whole yeah. thing yeah, yeah. and then blows his brains out mm-hmm. so i i think that because he's lived in hell yeah imagine living that long in that sunken place in that subconscious that sleep to like paralysis yeah. it would be fucking horrible well, so think of what would. he's had to do because he's granddad <sighs> isn't he so yeah it's later revealed that the armitage family's gran and gran and grandma have been put into two much younger african-american people so but and it's just it's it's they're obviously not always doing the gardening and cleaning up that's just a, for chris's benefit yeah so he feels i don't know if that would make you feel relaxed but if they were just walking around the house like this is Gran, you'd know it weren't. Well, yeah. So, and it, even when he does speak to them, they're a bit off. Mm. And by them being out of the picture, out of frame, to, so to speak, he he maybe he's not his suspicions aren't rising because he's not having a lot to do with them. Mm. I, oh, I read um, really really cool. Someone said if you actually watch um, Alison Williams' character, she played Rose, didn't she? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So if you watch her character, when it looks like she's fighting oppression from when the early 15 minutes into the film policeman pulls him over and asks for daniel's id and she stands up to him and goes why he weren't driving no no way and it was so clever i watched i read someone's opinion on it and it was like that's not so she's standing up to racism that's so the policeman can't know daniel's name to lead it back to her family chris's name oh shit yeah and apparently that's smart. if you watch it again she does something like that for, m- almost throughout the entire film yeah she's things that we perceive to be um liberalism and um sticking you know, up for her man yeah it's yeah. not it's all layered in concealing the oh, ultimate shit. end yeah i didn't even think of that but that's brilliant it's very layered i'd like to i, I would definitely watch it again for yeah. for just for that reason yeah me too man what else didn't you like about it it's a hard one. Oh, the anti-smoking oh my god <laughs> not because i'm pro-smoking but the fact that such a fucked up family... Yeah, have a problem with a man having a toke on a smoke. Take an issue of a guy having a cigarette, not knowing anything about him, his background or anything. Yeah. Like, smoking can be a crutch for people that have gone through shit. Of like, course his mum died yeah. at a young age. Yeah. He's got bad nerves. You yeah. Can, you, can tell, you can tell that. And the fact that they're so um, moral high ground about smoking and that she's okay with her daughter fucking her way through an, an entire community of people just for just for the gains of money yeah because they're bidding for them yeah. essentially isn't it it's like a sl- old slave market exactly it's like bingo and yeah the fact that she's like that's my daughter man that's my daughter you're smoking in front of my yeah. daughter you are mad yeah we harvest people here but you're going to smoke a cigarette smoking you're kills. a monster you are a monster yeah and I felt sorry for him that he couldn't have that smoke. The God. first one he went for, this huge guy just runs it in my shit myself. Oh, fuck yeah. God, I'd yeah. never smoke again. Yeah. Ooh. Anything else you didn't like? Nah, man. Yeah. It was, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a good film. I think it's, it's safe film. to say. So yeah. it is hard to dig out any dislikes. Yeah. I've got a few. Um, my main dislike is how uncomfortable it is. Now, I know it's meant to be. But Get Out is successful in its endeavours in creating a tense and taut thriller, yet the racist undertones and the peril of the protagonist is continuously unsettling. Thank God for Rod. Oh, yeah, the he, he yeah, uh, little little Rel Howery. Great name, Howery. Yeah, it's a great name. He's uh, he's that much needed comedic device within the film that sort of lightens it. Sexley. Yeah, he's brilliant. Without him mate it, it, it would be a it would a be pit a of darkness but it's meant to be dark it's meant to be uh difficult it's meant to be unnerving unsettling all those things and f- and f- it is successful in what it sets out to do peel is first and foremost a comedian so yeah. i think he has to keep a little bit of himself oh he's there. got yeah he's known for his sharp wit his is there any shows. comedy in nope um, yeah, there's elements. I think with with all of these films, there it would be impossible for someone with such uh, comedic talent to not have that ingrained into his stories. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's like part of, default for him. He's, he's a funny guy. 
So I think that, that you can see that in all of these films. And yeah, certainly without um, Howry in this one, it would have been a lot more harrowing. Howry um, harrowing. Yep. Uh, another thing I didn't like, it's not about the film necessarily, but shrinks. Oh, Psychiatrists. Yeah. I've had my fair share of experience with them and I'm always a little uncertain of those that have access to the deepest and darkest areas of our psyche. And uh, checkbooks. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, in this film, Chris's insecurities are weaponized for control and uh, made the cynical part of me question head doctors a bit mm-hmm. further. I think there's good ground to suspect that industry of not being 100% beneficial to people i get it some people really do need to talk oh of course strangers absolutely yeah but like like you say when i um seeked it out seeked out some some help from a professional you know the first thing that came to mind was yeah we're we're only doing uh zoom calls or video chats yeah we're not meeting in person i said oh that that was part of the reason i wanted to talk to someone in person Mm. because i I work in a job where you do zoom chats every single day so it's like i wanted that personal touch there's no reduction in price no. No, none, none no, at no, all. No, no, no. Oh, no, because we're still offering this thing that we've learned that's yeah. still not proven. But it works for some people, not all. Yeah, more often than not, if you're going through some sort of struggle, you want that interpersonal experience. You want to be able to look someone in the eye and, and be able to feel like you can you can open up through progression, through the trust that's grown between you and the counsellor, psychiatrist, whoever you're talking to, mm. that that relationship evolves and then you can talk more because you're more comfortable. It's very hard to do when there's two screens in front of that conversation. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. every human's different. So it's right to think that, say you benefit from a glass of orange juice in the morning, right. it does good stuff for you, the vitamin C. Yeah? My genetic makeup could be so different that vitamin C is probably bad for me in the morning. Yeah. That it's too acidic. It doesn't help me. That's exactly, it's exactly the same as the brain. But it's different strokes for different folks, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, totally. And listen, that's not a that's not a smear against psychiatrists yes, and, and stuff like that. Well, f- for me, it's not. Like I know they do a lot of good, but equally, there's some people. I feel like, w- especially in in the UK, you get what you pay for. So if you if you seek um, mental health advice from through the NHS, I know they're swamped. I know a lot of people are struggling. Millions of us are struggling. There's only so much that they can do. But if you put your hand in your pocket and you pay someone for their services, you get a better end product for it, I mm-hmm. feel anyway. Well, Joe List, the comedian, right. said it, and I, you know, he was bang on right. He said, um, <laughs> I see a psychologist recently. I think it's Joe List. I could be quoting this wrong. He goes, um, basically, the answer is it's your family. And it should always be that. It really is. Yeah. It's your family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not being able to be honest to the people that are closest to you. That yeah. is psychology 101. <laughs> well, we're we're all a product of our own environment, right? Yeah. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Um, the final thing I didn't like about it was Chris should have got out sooner. Get out. Yeah. It wouldn't have made much of a film if he did, but there were so many red flags on show, I would have legged it much, much earlier on. Yeah, but Af- Athlete's Feet had him stuck in there, didn't she? <laughs> That's her name now, is it? That's my name for her. For Alison Williams. Yeah. Yeah. But I, th- I, th- I just so feel many... like she jogs a lot. Okay. She, she feel it. She yes. I, I think that's a I think fair. She has a, I think she has a powdery foot. Okay. And you're more entitled to that. I'd love to uh, ask Alison Williams one day how her feet are. I'd love to get done libel for saying she had powdery feet. What a thing to be done for. Athlete feet. Maybe. Yep. But anyway, yeah, uh, it would have made for a shit film if the first hint of danger he legged it but i'm watching that and i'm and i'm like go now go now there's, there's they, problems here they pace it well enough to believe that he, he his love for her would keep him yeah there. yeah and as i say a film that i hi- hold in such high regards it is difficult for me to find things i didn't like so by the time i got to my third dislike i was mm-hmm. i was scraping the barrel basically mm-hmm. uh some questions for you mm-hmm Jordan Peele is making a huge name for himself as one of the top horror directors working today. His brand of filmmaking is more political than scary. Do you think other directors will try to emulate his methods, making Peele a trend-setting visionary? Um, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of examples if potentially anyone's taking influence from it, but it's hard, isn't it? No, I, I couldn't imagine. No slashers are political. They can't be. They're too shit. Yeah. Like... There's nothing political about Halloween. It's no. nothing to do with the, the the risks of growing up in an affluent suburb. Mm. There's, there's no po- politics involved, is there? Get Out Get Out has a really awesome subtext about um, 
modern day issues or what people consider say modern day issues in the majority in the US I would say it's a lot more um inherent out there um yeah I don't know if it would be a trendsetter for others to try with a horror film I can't think of an example see I I think that he I think in the years to come as um Peel puts out more projects does more films and stuff like that I think he's going to Im- increase and improve his back catalog and I think it's a matter of time before someone jumps up, jumps up and and tries to take direct influence. So you look at Tarantino in the early 90s and, and noughties. Mm. So many directors have come since him and tried to put a Tarantino stamp on their film. And it's got to the point now where it's like, okay, well, you're trying to do what Tarantino does. I think years down the line, we'll see a nucleus of new directors that are trying to politicise their horror films mm. like Bill has. And I think it will it will be varying levels of success. I think the man is is such a visionary and that's in that's saying that after only three feature releases, I think that he's gonna get stronger the more time he has to do it, the bigger budgets that come along, the the calibre of actors that wanna work with him, the the messages he's trying to put out, that it's a matter of time before people start trying to replicate him. Mm. That's just me. I love how he um he found similarities between say what the suffragettes went through like um what women went through fighting for the vote and equality because of that whole um primogeniture male dominated society so the fact that he found that link between um his own his own communities uh the way they're being trodden on and he found that link through what suffragettes went through and women and the, when you look at it like that it allows some people that can't ever fathom what he's talking about. If you say, okay, look what women went through. And that's regardless of say skin color. So it's, it was amazing that he found uh, similar things that have gone through history, be it white or black and apply the same logic to that. And you might get a better understanding of what it feels like to be second class citizen. Yeah. Perceived to be. And that, that um, reeks of intelli- intelligence, doesn't yeah. it? I'd like to see him um, take similar themes into different areas as well. So I away would, from horror. Well, no, no, not just horror, but I would like for him to try it on in other uh, instances of, you know, um, of injustices. So not just within a black community, I'd like to see him try and do it in other areas, you mm-hmm. know, where um, poverty was huge or there was genocide in areas. I think he could do a brilliant film uh, set in World War Two Germany. I think he could do a lot. Yeah, like be like you were saying, be this uh, game changer in terms of politicizing his films. Yeah, and if he keeps his horror undertones, his comedy undertones, I think he could smash it. Yeah, bright future ahead for for sure. Yeah, I consider Get Out to be a phenomenal debut. Do you think there is a danger of future work suffering from the release of such a strong directorial debut? I didn't like Us. Is it no? Us? Yeah, no, I didn't like second it. film. Okay. Yeah, I didn't really enjoy it. I didn't like the concept. Um, I didn't think much of Red as a character. I thought it was overacted. Mm. Didn't like the voice. I didn't enjoy it. Okay. Which for me, it was polarizingly different to Get Out. Mm. Get Out has a lot of, maybe that political undertone about race is really what really drives Get Out. Yeah. I don't know about us. I don't know what he was trying to say about it. It's a bit more um, high concept, I'd argue. Yeah. Yeah. Hands across the world. See, I, um, I think it can be also almost like a negative thing to come out of the gates so strong because if your first film that you do is is so groundbreaking so highly applauded with huge accolades and everything mm. everything else is competing with that and i'd argue that if your first film was all right your second film was all right maybe a bit better and then you improve through your filmography i think there may be a bigger value in that if your first it goes with music as well. That's why so many people are one-hit wonders. They come out and their strongest song is an absolute banger. Charlie and Eddie. Anything else afterwards is pales in comparison. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's yes, yeah, an interesting question. I, I think, think a little bit of um, restraint or film celibacy would work in that instance. So give yourself five, six years before you bring another one out. Whereas I think, say this was 2017, what was us? 2019. And then Nope was uh, this year. 2022 that's not that's too that's he's doing it too quickly mm. in my opinion if if they're lose if they're degrading not degrading what's the word they're depreciating yeah like us was i haven't seen nope yeah i'm not, I'm not in a huge rush to watch it i love the concept of aliens but just on some 
reviews and feedback I've seen, it's not blown anyone away. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's a common consensus that um, Get Out is his strongest film. Mm-hmm. I enjoy, I've enjoy. i enjoyed all three of his films and I'd certainly align with that with that theory that his first one was the best. He's a project man though, isn't he? Yeah. He's got his Key and Peele show. He, he does lots of sketches and yeah. and stand. And uh, I don't know, if, he does do a form of stand up with, uh, say him, Key and Peele both do stand up for their show, don't they? Do they? Yeah, before they air their sketches. Okay. They're essentially doing a, uh, a bit on stage all the time. So I could try. And they were in Fargo it. together, weren't they? What? Yeah. Fargo season two, I think. With yeah. Ewan McGregor? Is no, that, no. Is that the second one? No, no. The second one. Um, with um, David Carradine, Keith Carradine, I always get the, the, yeah. the two confused. Yeah. They're, they're oh, in Fargo. They play, they play two hitmen. Okay. Really good. I need to watch that again. Two's the one set in the seventies. Oh, right. Or it could have been the first one. Well, they're in Fargo somewhere. They're in Fargo somewhere. Yeah, cool. Uh, my final question, you have to harvest a part of me to improve your own life. What are you taking from my body to enhance your life and why? God, do I have to? Yes, you do, because it's the question I have. Um, oh, that's hard. Look you up and down. Well, it doesn't have to necessarily be my physical features. You could take a part of my mental attributes, maybe. Nothing. Too nervous. Uh, could I take your oh. weight? Oh, I guess. That's sweet. That's like a six stone drop. I'm in. Okay, I feel I feel hurt a little bit. Anyway, what would you rate um, Get Out out of ten? Eight point five. Okay, explain. Um, love it. Love subtext. Excellent plot. Screenplay is justified in the Writers Guild of America saying it's the best of the twenty first century. It's innovative. It's very enjoyable. Um, I think in maybe in some points parts it it. it, it it struggles to formulate its own strong identity because it is it is peppered with comedy. Yeah. But not um it's comedy is not wrought throughout. So there's a couple of comedic moments which can take away from Chris's experience. So Chris is going through hell, he's got tears coming down his face. Yeah. It's only when he starts really killing people that it then becomes more of a dark comedy. Yeah. It's you know, it's always weird. I enjoy the comedy, but I felt like it either, it needed to be a bit more consistent run concurrently alongside it. Yeah, I, I think you've summarised that perfectly. One of the whiteies should have been funny. Maybe. And they weren't, not one of them. Yeah, I think they're meant to be detestable. That's that's what works for it. But I, yeah, I certainly, what you say ties in with, with how I feel. I'd rate it 8 out of 10, which is still a bloody good score. Love it. Seen it about four or five times now. And mm-hmm. I feel like it, it maybe improves on each watch. Um, that gives Get Out a total score of 16.5 out of 20, which is bloody good. Sweet. If you like your films entertaining as well as having a lot to say, if you like to hate on rich old white people, or if you like to be intimidated by a teacup, this could be a film for you. Consider watching this one if you enjoyed Us, Nope, and Sorry to Bother You. Should we play a game? See. Si. The game in question is what the plot, where the rules are simple and the results, quite the opposite. Harry will conceive an original idea from his big and beautiful brain and give birth to a plot. It is then down to me to nurture this thought by providing a film title, genre, cast and anything else I can think of to raise this brainchild into a fully functioning film concept. Over to you, Harry. Modern day America. I'm thinking like the Plains Nations, like um, Monument Valley, you know, them famous cowboy shots of wide open landscapes out in the Midwest, out in the West. So what, what would they be classed as? Well... Midwest? No, Midwest is like Chicago, so okay. further west. Monument Valley, so kind of like your Grand Canyon looking areas. Okay. And your open plains, you know, where Buffalo and that stride. Oh, got you. Uh, it's modern day. And I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a horror, but it's uh, essentially hikers and um, tourists and dudes who are driving through the area and camping, wild camping, throwing their litter everywhere, getting drunk, being just straight up dudes. Boom, start the film get attacked mutilated and murdered and the camera just shows you the bodies they've been scalped and everything anyway film starts essentially what i was thinking is that a a reservation of native indians who live in modern times are just so disgusted about their past and how they were treated and pushed off their own lands they have a really radical chief who decides to go warrior class again so these modern day indians start putting on the get up getting on the horses and taking down tourists when they're at their most vulnerable, when they're drunk at little, uh, drunk at campfires and stuff. So they're they're taking these people out because of their lack of respect for these people's home. Yeah, but it is it was and it is their land, so it's almost like a a a, a revolution that's 150 years late, committed by modern 
modern modern native Indians whose whose ancestors were probably killed, pushed away from their lands and stuff. So it's almost like a revenge film set 150 years after the root cause. So uh, yeah, creepy though. Like I wouldn't have it with any comedic undertones. I'd make it quite creepy. Okay. Like imagine you'd think you'd seen a ghost, wouldn't you? Say you're at a campfire drinking, spitting, throwing your rubbish everywhere and just this painted up native Indian just rides in on a horse and just hacks one of them down. And it's just, and maybe one of them people get away to a police station and they're like, we, we've been attacked, we've been attacked, who attacked you? Um, a, a native Indian on a horse with a hatchet. And they just piss themselves. Yeah. You're right, honey. Yeah, sure. There ain't been no native Indian around here for years. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe they, to um, to sort of make these um, Chad dude stories Ch- less believable. Chad dudes. They could uh, maybe the native the natives use some of the the natural resources to to drug them. So when they turn up, they're all spaced out, and it looks like they've been high on drugs. So it makes their story even more unrealistic. Peyote. Peyote. What this? Peyote. It's a hallucinogenic mushroom. I think that the native Indians used. Okay. Or peony, I can't remember. Okay, it's one I like of them. I like the sound of that. Mm. I do. Big fan of the sound mm. of this. So, in summary, it's uh, set in modern America. Could be comical. In the sort of uh, Grand Canyon open plain environment. Mm. Beautiful. You, you see, this is primarily a horror, and yeah. the story is about some hiker, t- hikers, tourists, Chad Anyone. dudes, bros, sort of littering, not respectful of the environment, just being real dickheads, basically, just there for a good time, partying. Um, just being a nuisance on the environment, on the local people, just being a real eyesore, earsore, all of the sores, just fucking it's nightmare. Deep people. lying political as well. Yeah. Um, and the there's a reservation nearby where the natives are sick of this. This isn't the, this isn't an isolated incident. This shit's happening all the time. People go on their spring breaks or whatever here, drinking, boozing, mm-hmm. drugs, all of that shit. They've had enough. Kill animals so, for sport. Yes. Yeah, so the natives, they go warrior and they take down the tourists and they basically seek vengeance for the misuse of their, their land and their home and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I would see the director being um, S. Craig Zala, who did Bone Tomahawk, Dragged, um, across, dragged concrete. across Concrete. Yeah, really gritty, exciting, up-and-coming filmmaker whose films are violent. With experience dark. in that setting. Yeah, in that setting, yeah, exactly. Um, the casting of the Chads can be anyone, doesn't matter. No big names, just young Chad like Americans that are just a puff fucking pain in the arse. Yeah. And I think the focus of the casting would be on the um Native Americans. Mm-hmm. So I would have as the sort of chief um Morris Birdie Yellowhead from Apocalypto. Mega. Uh Wes Studi from Hostiles. Um Zahn McLaren from Fargo and Bone Tomahawk. Yeah, he's in Bone Tomahawk. Yeah. All, so you'd have these these three guys at the core. And similar to Get Out. What a cast. Similar to Get Out, I'd have um, Amber Midthunder, who was from Prey, mm. as like the character that um, Alison Williams play in Get Out. So allure. she could be a Native American that's sort of a lure to these Honey boys. trap. Yes, yeah, so a sort of a honey trap that gets them, gets them closer to the natives. You've just blown my mind because if she can lure them into the reservation, I think that's where Native Indian law is works um, yeah. alone from federal law. Yeah. So they could murder, scalp and do all that shit there and bury the bodies on the reservation and deny police entry. Yes. Very well done. Yes. Great Thank casting you. as well, especially Zahn McLaren and he's, he's mega. In so, Doctor Sleep, he's my favourite character. Yeah. So that I think that gives it a level of authenticity as well to have Native Amer- uh, Native American actors in these, these roles. Um, so yeah, it would be a S. Craig Zala film starring Morris Birdie Yellowhead, Wes Studi, Zahn McLaren, and Amber Midthunder. And I'd call the film... Pray to. Native. Hey, Chad, where shall I throw the empties, bro? Anywhere you like, Chad, there's no one out here. Guys, isn't that, like, mean on the environment or something? Who gives a fuck, Chelsea? This is America's trash bin. Get us another beer and shut up. They disrespect our land disregard the nature, and dispose of their waste in our home. Chug, 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 USA, USA, USA. I will not allow this anymore. Let's take our land back. Treat the earth and all that dwell therein with respect. This summer, 
They fight for what's right. Native coming soon.